Hey everyone and welcome to WPA 2.0. I'm Michael Norris, the Executive Director of Carpenters Hall, and we're honored to be hosting this important discussion with our friends at Mural Arts. Carpenters Hall is a National Historic Landmark in Philadelphia. It was built by the Carpenters Company in the early 1770s and is most famous for hosting the First Continental Congress, one of the most significant events in our nation's history. The Carpenters Company was founded in 1724 as a guild of master builders, and it still exists today as a professional association of architects, builders, and engineers. The primary mission of the company is to preserve and interpret Carpenters Hall, but we also have a larger interest in the built environment and in the design crafts. Our current exhibit is titled Places for the People, and it features a series of WPA posters depicting iconic buildings in Philadelphia. As we explored public programming in conjunction with the exhibit, I was struck by how the economic crisis triggered by the pandemic was similar to the Great Depression of the 1930s, which led to the WPA and its efforts to employ the artists who made the posters in our exhibit and many others. I thought about how a new WPA could help to alleviate the damage the pandemic has had on so many artists and cultural organizations this year. So I was thrilled to learn that many artists and activists around the country, some of whom you're about to hear from directly, were already organizing around this idea. Finally, before we get to the conversation, I'd like to recognize and acknowledge the sponsor of this event, the engineering firm McCormick Taylor. It's now my great pleasure to introduce our moderator for this evening, the passionate and always inspiring executive director of Mural Arts Philadelphia, Jane Golden. Jane? Hey Michael, how are you? And thank you, Good. Carpenters Hall. Um, I'm thrilled to be here tonight. And thank you for all you do for our city, Michael Norris. I've known you a long time and you're a long distance runner as it, as it relates to supporting arts and culture. So, hi everybody, hello. I'm thrilled to be moderating a panel with three esteemed guests, Raquel Deanda, Carlton Turner, and Ennis Carter. As someone who got their start as a muralist, my first job was um, that I was hired by Judy Baca, who is amazing to do a mural in Los Angeles. She became a great role model for me. And later as somebody running a community-based public art program, I've always been intrigued by the WPA. We have employed literally thousands and thousands of artists over the years, providing artists with a platform for creative expression, as well as a means of employment. Just as important, we have come to understand how an artistic process shapes conceptual thinking about place and that the work we do can both reflect and generate community. Whether it's in environmental justice, criminal justice, behavioral health, or art education, we've witnessed how art can be put to work as a tool and catalyst as process and object with and for the public in the shared spaces of our wonderful and very complex city. Um, now with unemployment at its highest, equaling Great Depression levels, with the federal government eroding physical infrastructure needs, as well as rolling back environmental health and safety protection at a time when the pandemic levels are high and rising, the need to support the arts and strengthen the cultural infrastructure is absolutely 100% critical. So how are we going to do this? What are the new ideas being generated by artists and cultural workers today? How do we move into a time of mutual support and collaboration? What are the best practices and creative ideas being stirred up right now? Our panel will shed some light on these issues. But first, I would like to introduce each of our panelists so they can talk about the inspiring work that they are currently involved in. I would like to first introduce Ennis Carter. Ennis is a curator and author of Posters for the People, Art of the WPA. She is also the director of Social Impact Studios. Welcome, Ennis. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jane and everybody. I'm so glad to be here tonight. So as the curator and author of Posters for the People, which is a project that documents and celebrates posters that were made during the original WPA, I wanted to take a little bit of time to talk about our project, but really frame an understanding of the WPA um, at, uh, in its genesis and um, what it did to 
support the infrastructure of our country, but really what it did to support um, art and culture and artists. So I'm going to share my screen and um, just go through a couple of visuals because we are talking about posters. Uh, so we need some visuals here. So um, as I said, Posters to the People is a project um, to document the posters specifically that were made during the WPA. And um, I just wanted to take a couple minutes, hang on. All right, um, so first of all, I'd like to make sure to um, be clear about the, uh, what WPA actually stands for. So when it was originally um, brought into being uh, as an executive order by Franklin Roosevelt, it was called the Work Progress Administration. Um, and most people just called it WPA. Later in 1939, it was actually changed to Work Projects um, because the word pro progress uh, also was the domain of the Progressive Party. So there was a little bit of pushback on that and it was changed to the very clear uh, title of what it really was, which was Work Projects um, for a, uh, an unemployed, unemployed country. So, the Great Depression between 1929 and 1933 left the economy uh, in shambles. And at, at its height, 20% of, um, of working uh, aged Americans were out of work. And so Franklin Roosevelt ran on a platform called the New Deal. And the New Deal was really designed to put, uh, give people an opportunity to get back to work and address a lot of the um, not just crumbling infrastructure, but infrastructure that hadn't even existed before the WPA. So highways that we drive on now and bridges that we drive on now and the electricity to the south um, came through the WPA. So over 3.3 million Americans were hired um, over a period of a little over 10 years um, to work in the WPA um, at living wages at the time um, to do all sorts of things. So most people are familiar with the infrastructure projects, so highways and bridges and um, other buildings that were built. Uh, it was a significant uh, employer of um, textile and other manufacturing um, to make sure that people, that Americans had jobs. Um, and a big part of the equation was the arts. And what is so wonderful about this story is that the arts were considered a critical part of the social fabric. And so artists were hired at living wages and in some, in some cases higher wages than manual laborers um, to do the work that they do best. So Jane mentioned the muralists, um, lots of post office murals and murals all across the country. Um, there were also fine uh, uh, painting, sculpture, print, lithography, things like that. Um, there was a very robust federal theater project um, that brought theater uh, all across the country. We have to remember there was no TV, <laughs> you know, there was no Wi-Fi or any kind of YouTube, but there was no television. So entertainment was the radio and theater. And so people um, in these hard times uh, were given an opportunity to work and also in community to enjoy theater. So one small part of the federal art project was the poster division. And the poster division were um, out of work commercial artists, which is basically the term back then for graphic designers um, and advertising um, artists. Uh, and so those folks were hired to create posters that promoted values of the administration, but also very specific information like those theater projects, that theater project I was talking about, they needed to get the word out about the production. So there was a lot of posters made um, about uh, theater productions. Um, so this is really the genesis of this conversation. And it's important to recognize the posters because they are more of a lens into the WPA than anything else but they were made by amazing um, uh, graphic designers at the time. And I also just wanted to point out that the use of silkscreen as a poster medium was really perfect. It was really brought to um, the milieu by and perfected by 
uh, WPA artists. Um, there was a, a designer uh, in the New York division uh, named Anthony Valonis, who had been a wallpaper maker, and he saw how uh, screen printing could be used to make multiple copies, um, making it a very public uh, art that almost anybody could uh, reproduce uh, in, in large quantity. So I do think that we have, um, that Andy Warhol and Shepard Ferry and Carita Kent have the WPA artists to thank for such an um, amazing uh, advancement in screen printing technology. But really, it's all about um, promoting the ideals of a society and not just art, but also the thing, the fabric that holds a society together. So all sorts of different things were promoted, different books, different um, cultures, different um, histories, uh, different job opportunities and places, um, as well as just health and safety. So um, this all started because we found that there were posters that were not documented. Um, and so Posters for the People is a project that actually documents the, the, all of the posters that we can find that are still out there. It wasn't considered fine art, so there was no record of it. Um, and that's what we do at Posters for the People. But ultimately, this is a snapshot into an era that has a very particular set of like public values and a um, look and feel, but it has a through line to today um, to really connect to the concept of the role of art as a public narrative, in the public narrative. Um, and that's what I'm excited to talk about tonight. So thank you. Thank you very much, that was great. Um, and now I would like to introduce Raquel Deanda of the United States Department of Arts and Culture and the People's WPA. Welcome Raquel. COVID, COVID problems, <laughs> pandemic times. Um, thank you for inviting me into this conversation. It's really great to be diving deeper into, um, into this, these conversations about what new funding can look like during the moment that we're living in. Uh, my name is Raquel de Anda. I am, uh, my, I'm part of the team at the USDAC. I'm uh, Minister of Bridge Building is my official title. I'm calling in from Laredo, Texas, which is the ancestral territory of the Carrizo Come Crudo and the Pauitecan. As part of the USDAC practice, we really like honoring the native land from which people are calling in from. So I just wanted to name that. Um, I'd love to speak a little bit about the uh, new, this new project, the People's WPA, that the USDAC has recently launched and is currently uh, fully involved in. And um, in order to do that, I'm going to share my screen. So give me one second. Um, there it is. Then let me. Sorry, I'm just having some technical difficulties on my end, surprise, surprise. All right, so um, are you guys able to see my screen? Beautiful, okay. So, um, so when the pandemic hit, the USDAC hosted a series of listening calls with our network. The USDAC, as folks may or may not know, is actually not an official government institution, but rather we're a grassroots network of artists and cultural workers who are committed to imagining and building a more just and equitable world. So um, as part of this process of imagining and building a world, listening is really central to our work. So we hosted a series of listening calls and from that um, developed this people's, the idea for the People's WPA program. Um, a core belief at the USDAC is that everything we create must first be imagined. So in this process, we're really trying to bring people into this practice of imagining what a new WPA program could be, what a people's WPA program could be. So our vision um, at, with the people's WPA 
is to basically show how transformative work is already happening in vibrant and vital ways across this country, to connect progressive policy platforms like the Movement for Black Lives Breathe Act or the Poor People's Campaign's Jubilee platform with transformative cultural work that's also happening and to show how there's a connection and how, how this transformative policy can actually affect true change within our country. And to convince policymakers to invest in arts, culture, and newly imagined sectors of labor that are really critical to our healing and survival. So um, the People's WPA is centered around seven themes, which we believe will really help us redefine the sectors of labor that are most needed in this historical moment. Um, to put it in its simplest form, these are the type, this is the type of work that we believe the government needs to support in order to repair, to heal, and to create a thriving society. It's work that's centered around healing, regeneration, truth-telling, liberation, nourishment, remembering, and deepening democracy. And I'll speak a little bit more about this. Um, healing is really understood as uplifting traditional forms of healing and ancestral wisdoms, ever-present ways of dealing with physical and emotional well-being. Um, thinking about even practices like uh, midwives and doulas. Uh, the work of midwives and doulas. Remembering looks to um, enrich our present, future, our present and our future through archiving the past. So folks who are working on, on books, on posters, on oral history projects and digital platforms. Deepening democracy uh, is a type of labor that we see as really looking to create new decision-making structures that are accountable to communities. Um, regeneration really focuses on cultural workers who are repairing the damage that's been done to our public land and supporting communities and building sustainable futures through climate justice. Um, Truth-telling is another theme of labor that we're seeing, which really, uh, or that we wanted to lift up, which looks at confronting power in the streets through nonviolent creative direct action, performance, creative ritual. These are the visionaries who are fueling the mass popular movements that we need in order to really transform society. Um, nourishment looks at sustaining communities through food and seed banks. And um, most recently, as we, see, as we saw through the tremendous mutual aid network uh, work and network that swept across the country. And then liberation is the last sort of theme of work, of labor, that we see as focusing on the carceral state and um, lifting up the work of cultural workers who are working to tear down the walls of prisons and detention centers and really looking to demilitarize our borders and our urban, urban centers. So, um, you know, we were thinking about how, to, like, how, do, how do we do this work, right? Who's doing this work? How do we really lift it up? And so our next step was, was really selecting 25 collaborators to help show how this work is already being done in society. Um, despite the fact that it's already being done, it's often unrecognized, it's underfunded, and it's very little supported. So this is the really, what we see as the very kind of work that needs to be amplified in this moment during this crisis that we're living in. And we understand that any hope of a livable future, any hope whatsoever, is really dependent on nourishing the cultural fabric of our communities. It's focused on healing past injustices and structural racisms that, are, that our country not only is founded on, but that is currently still mired in. And these are just 25 of, of millions of workers in this country that could be supported to really help heal and transform society. We received at the WPA over 400, I'm sorry, at the USDAC over 400 applications, and we focused on these 25 voices to bring into our work as collaborators to help us tell the story. And we asked them, we've been asking them, how do we support the kind of labor that you're involved in? So um, at this point, we've heard a lot of resonant themes. I'm just going to name a couple. Artists need physical infrastructure. They need time. They need funding to do their work well. I don't think any of this is new information, but it's something that we really need to just dig deeper into figuring out how the government can play a proactive role in providing these things in an equitable and a sustainable way. Um, there's models all over the world and we need to be doing more of it here. And um, there are other notions like recognizing that artists are networks and job creation hubs. They create rich and thriving places for social workers, for farmers, for educators to better do their work. And it works both ways, right? Um, we can place community artists in schools, hospitals, prisons, community centers, social service organizations. Um, these, these are just some of the resonant themes. There's others listed on this, on this um, 
sheet here that I'm not going to go into, but there, there are many themes that we're seeing lifted up that we're re really wanting to articulate in this work. And, um, you know, our, our next thought is really thinking about how we enter the policy conversation. Our strength at the USDAC is as storytellers, as artists, and we're really looking to deliver our message through this process. Um, where we'll be, print, we'll be producing a printed publication that will feature essays, artwork, content from prog progressive policy platforms and information about the work that I just shared. We're looking at actually distributing these to different government off, um, officials. And um, we'll be developing toolkits geared towards training artists on how to impact policy at local levels. And then we'll also be looking at different ways of activating the content. So thinking about different site-specific interventions, performances, public rituals we can have in very particular places to help amplify. And so yeah, uh, again, coming back to the core belief at USDAC, in order to change the world, we have to change the story. And the People's WPA is part of that narrative shift. Wow, thank you. That was like really super inspiring. Um, okay, now I want to introduce Carlton Turner. Carlton is the founder of the Mississippi Center for Cultural Production and co-founder of the Cultural New Deal for Cultural and Racial Justice. Welcome, Carlton. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carlton Turner. As she just said, I uh, live and reside in Utica, Mississippi, uh, which is home of the Choctaw, Chickasaw, the Yazoo people. Um, and I'm excited to be a part of this conversation. Um, so I'm going to spend most of my time talking about the Cultural New Deal and, and can address some of the work that I'm doing in Mississippi. Uh, but I think it's important to kind of set the context for uh, the, the creation of the Cultural New Deal. And I dropped a link uh, to the website in the chat box so people can go and see the work for yourself. Um, but I think f first and foremost, um, thinking about where we were uh, when we began working on this document, we were in basically the early days of, of the pandemic, uh, when the country was beginning to shut down um, and, and people were you know, concerned for that. You know, we're still concerned for our health. We've seen the pandemic blossom uh, over the last uh, few months uh, because of negligence and, and poor leadership. Um, but we were in the early days. And, and what began as a, a moment to pause because of the pandemic, uh, became this moment of, of racial unrest, uh, kind of like beginning to spill out into the streets in ways that we hadn't seen uh, in, a, in a long time in this country. Um, and they weren't just Black people marching for Black folks, right? They were basically um, the entire country getting out to, to march against injustice. Uh, and we began writing this Cultural New Deal uh, as an opportunity to create an intervention um, to disrupt the return to the status quo, uh, because it's we have a very short memory uh, as Americans. Our news cycle is 24 hours, so if it doesn't last longer than, than, the, than this you know, momentary news cycle, we forget what happened yesterday. And a lot of us have already forgotten that at the beginning of this year, the early part of this year, um, you know, the streets were, were being flooded with, with voices that were saying that what's going on right now in our country is unacceptable, uh, that the lives of Black people um, uh, are, valuable, they matter, and how do we uh, make sure that we don't forget this, that this becomes part of the national conversation. Uh, and, you know, of course, we're also in, in, in the throes of uh, an election uh, and, and trying to get people uh, out of this idea that the chaos that had been created by the current administration will, is, it will be our normal going forward. Um, and so for us, writing this, this document was really a clarion call for us to think about um, what needs to change, what needs to be different uh, in our approach, in the way that we think about our relationship to community, as we think about our relationship to uh, government, to, to state, local, federal um, initiatives and, and institutions. Um, and we know that, as Jeff Chang put it, uh, you know, culture change precedes policy change. So what is the culture shift that we're looking to, um, to, to help spark in the community in the streets? And so the Cultural New Deal, which is, a, is um, I, I can share just a little bit of the screen here. Hopefully it won't uh, run into any problems. Um, but the Cultural New Deal, um, first I wanna just give a shout out to the organizations that were part of this work, um, Art Change Us, uh, the Center for Cultural Power, 
First People's Fund, the National Association of Latino Arts and Culture, Race Forward, and the organization that I work with um, in Mississippi uh, and founded with my wife, Sip Culture, which is also known as the Mississippi Center for Cultural Production. And the Cultural New Deal really focuses on five main frames. Um, and it's to support recognition and prioritization of the leadership of Black people, Indigenous people, and people of color. Um, the reversal of long-term inequities in funding, hiring, and resources in the arts and culture sector. We're seeing this kind of fight play out right now in real time as Biden, 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 Biden uh, and his incoming administration is beginning to name department heads and cabinet positions and whatnot. And we see uh, so many old faces, so many people that, uh, that are not new ideas, that are not uh, progressive folks are being put into these positions again. Um, an investment in arts and cultural ecosystems for black, indigenous, and communities of color. An investment in building healthy communities through centering cultural and racial equity. Something that if we think about it has been made illegal by the current administration uh, to even have conversations about racial equity uh, in, a, in an official um, state capacity. Um, and accountability, commitment, and integrity in the pursuit of cultural and racial justice. And I think that is, is is the really guiding principle for this work. We're looking to impact the way that people are approaching the work of artists, uh, not just as entertainers, uh, but as the holders of culture, the holders of the center of community, the, 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 those storytellers, uh, those weavers that help to um, keep the, the fabric of the community together in ways that are, um, are about healing and about uplifting a different type of, of, of well-being. Uh, and what we see this as is a, a, a diversion from the status quo. Uh, and what we, the danger of this moment is that we've been so inundated with chaos uh, over the last four years that just to get back to normal uh, is, is a win. Um, and we say that that isn't a win because normal wasn't working for us. Normal was actually killing us. Uh, and normal will continue to be uh, a, a, a part of the demise of our community. So um, I'm going to stop there because I'm really interested in the conversation. But the Cultural New Deal is there's a document. Um, we are not an organization. We are not um, an accountability community uh, to hold institutions accountable to the Cultural New Deal. Um, as Raquel said, nothing can be manifested until it's imagined. And we imagine the world that uh, we wanna be a part of being founded in these ideas that are written within the cultural New Deal. Um, thank you, thank you. Um, so, so, what I, so Carlton, so we're in a country that is deeply divided and deeply frayed. And, and with the work you do in Mississippi, um, so it's a two, two part question, one, do you, do you get government support, local and state government support? If you do, how do you get buy-in? And then more broadly, with the work that you're doing and Raquel's doing, like how, how do you start to build partners? And, 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 and in part of the work we do in Philly over 30 years of work at being part of city government is really getting people in city government to see the value, that there's, that there's a real value in um, working with arts organizations. Um, that didn't like happen overnight. So what's the strategy? Um, what are you thinking? How does it work for you? And then how do you, what's the vision? So, um, so for me, uh, I will answer the question about where we get support. We don't get support from um, state or federal government. Um, and I think that's for a few reasons. One, from a state point of view, um, Mississippi is an ultra conservative place. Um, our leadership um, basically just reiterates Trump talking points. And so that's the type of climate that we have to exist in. And that's the reality of the moment. Um, and our uh, state art agencies are anemic. Uh, they, don't, they, don't, they don't take a lot of risk and chances of, of rocking the boat. Um, I think our work has always been centered on partnership and collaboration. I think that's just the basis of what we do. So the idea and thoughts about collaboration and partnership is that we do everything in partnership. I can't think of one program or initiative or piece of work that we do that's just about us doing it as an organization. It's always about our relationship to our community, our relationship to our partners, our relationship to the larger ecosystem of arts and cultural leaders uh, and activists and movement people that are interested in, in 
bending the arc of the universe more towards justice and in a more radical way um, than just, you know, just moving it throughout this, this time and thinking that everything will eventually uh, fall in our favor. That's not how it works. Organizing is the, is the key. Uh, and we have to do that in partnership and collaboration. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Um, Ennis, when you hear people talking about uh, visions for today, uh, as someone who's really looked at the WPA closely over a longer period of time, um, what do you think when you hear people talking about, I, I've heard the phrase used more recently than, than I have in many, many years. Uh, what, 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 do you, what do you hope that they mean? Like, what, what is, is this sort of a, a dream? I mean, is it, it's sort of interesting, isn't it, is. it, to hear it revive? It is, to hear people talking about a new deal and even the Green New Deal and everything being kind of positioned through this lens. Even people that don't know the history, it is part of the vernacular now, and that is good to hear. And it's not un unlike what I'm hearing everybody talking about, which is I hope people think of it first and foremost as a some sort of publicly funded and the word public is a different thing nowadays. Um, so I think we need to think about what public means, um, and, uh, but that it's a publicly funded investment in and commitment to a common good that's centered on workers having an ability to like be self-determined and work. <laughs> um, at a, like that's at its center. And so what, I, what I'm hearing you know, tonight confirms that too, which is it's not so much about a specific bureaucratic system that then like, you know, like administers and effectuates some kind of change, but it's about the, what, whatever we decide our dem democratic public perception is, is that it's invested and committed to a common good and the fabric of society and that we're responsible for that. That isn't going to come from like corporations or government agencies that we have nothing to do with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what I hope people know it yeah. means and are, and are willing to be agents, like have agency in that. Right, right. So, um, so for Carlton and Raquel, so, you know, um, this is sort of, you know, it's really interesting to hear what you're saying, because I think when I have thought about the WPA, I think, in, and in today's world, I think about a program that would offer an abundance of decent paying jobs and cultural development, especially to repair the frayed social fabric. So do you, so what I'm hearing is that this is not just a jobs program, it's something broader, deeper, more complex, more nuanced. Uh, where does the jobs component like fit in for you and how do you sort of parse that out? I mean, I, I, for me, I think it's, it's, it's really recognizing what all the different kinds of labor that exists, right? Sort of querying the understanding of what arts is, querying the understanding of what labor is and looking to see how people are supporting society or really creating the cultural fabric that's allowing society to thrive. And um, I think, you know, in, in some of our work, you can, you can see some of that in the collaborators that we're working with and in some of the themes that we've lifted up. And um, that, that for us is, is the work, right? And we hope that the, the, if we are to create a new WPA, that we're really elevating this kind of labor in, um, and, and also supporting real policy and finding actual material support for people who are doing this essential work. Um, so yeah, it just, it, it, it's, it's, uh, I think it takes looking at things through a really particular lens that also, um, looks at the history, at the broken history that our country is founded on and works to repair that, works to repair racial inequalities, works, works to, um, just uh, uplift the building and thriving of communities. Yeah. Carlton, anything to add? Yeah, I, I think, um, I think this notion of, um, and I think this is not in all, at all contrary to what Raquel is saying. Um, the racial history and the foundation of this nation um, means that the, those relationships and those things were, have been broken from the very beginning. And so the job is just not to repair, it's actually to build something anew that has never existed as part of this, this, this framework on this nation. 
Um, and that's a different job. And, and that's why artists are, are fit to be at the forefront, at, at the vanguard of this movement, because we need visionaries. We need, we need people with imagination uh, as their central point of focus, not just imagination when they get paid to imagine, but their entire world is imagining and manifesting things that don't exist um, and, and that are operating from this lens of justice and equity to build something that this country has never seen. Uh, and, and I think that that's, that's the challenge that we face today because this, this idea of getting back to normal um, is, is a very dangerous idea. Um, this idea that, that we can move through uh, this pandemic, we can move through this, this racial injustice and, and uprisings, and that we can come back in 2021, forget that 2020 ever happened, and everything can go back to the way that it was and people could be happy again. Um, and uh, the climate issues that we're facing are issues that are, um, they're, they're, they're once in a lifetime issues. This, this climate issue is a once in a lifetime issue. Uh, and if we don't do the work that we need to do now, then all of the other work that we're talking about is actually irrelevant. Um, and we have to move with that urgency um, and with the clarity of, and sense of purpose that we're not trying to get back to normal, but we're actually trying to move the world into a different um, era. Thank you. So the as so so this as so the aspiration is huge. So Raquel, let me go to you. So the work you do is is really impressive. It's um, it straddles lots of areas. You curate, produce, you mobilize major initiatives. Um, uh, I said before we're fans in Philly. We want you to come to Philly and do a project. But but so so in order to do something like this, like I I think that it's going to take, and maybe I'm wrong, the, the public sector and the private sector, right? So for the, to, you're operating on the outside, sort of, so, so you'd be, so you're sort of, there's, for those who operate outside, it's, it's easy and, and understandable how one has a, a healthy critique of government. It's, so is there something to be said for working with government? Can what you're describing coexist with government can there be, do you think, autonomy, creativity, and of most importance, a focus on equity in working with government? We know government funding can provide infrastructure funding, administer programs. Is it worth it? Yeah, I think this is a really good and provocative question, really, because we're, um, we're used to a system that is broken, that doesn't work, right? Um, and I think that in many ways, we're taught to fear government. But, um, and, and if there's anything I know is that if, in order for artists to do good work in the world, they require creative autonomy. And this is why you hire art, uh, artists. It's, a, it's what Carlton just named, right? Because artists are thinking and working in ways that others aren't. Artists, and again, queering the idea of what an artist means, a cultural worker, right? People who, who have bold visionary ideas. And this isn't something that you want to constrain. It's actually not something that you can constrain. And um, I do think that it's possible for the government to support people without telling them what to do. Um, I think that, um, you know, again, coming back to this idea that we're raised to sort of fear government, right? I think we also need to keep in mind that the current institutions that we have, philanthropy and the private sector, within those institutions, there's a huge amount of censorship and inequity that's built into, into it. And I think the, the Cultural New Deal that Carlton is lifting up names that as well, right? And so these are elements that, that um, we need to recognize um, that it's happening and it's happening through exclusion. We're not recognizing it, right? So some people get funded, other people don't. And I think that, if we were able to really, if government was able to really give people money in a sustainable way and get out of the way, um, if government was able to just offer infrastructure for artists to work in and then let artists do what they need to do within those spaces, I think we'd be able to see a really transformative way in which artists are working with community. Um, so I do think that I, I do think that there's a possibility of this sort of inside out, outside game, right? Where, where we're pushing forward progressive policy, where government is then creating a sort of a platform or framework for artists and society to work in. And um, within that, 
uh, where we're able to really see communities and individuals thrive. Interesting. So because the WPA, you know, was really top down, right? So artists, it was good, good, good artists were getting paid, but it was like the federal government in capital letters. So, so I'd like to, so Carlton and Ennis, do, uh, oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm just saying, I'm saying that that, that that's, I think that that system works as long as there's creative autonomy given to artists within that. Right, right. right. I was saying the 1930s, it was like yeah. sort of that. Yeah, but that's, this is a, the different, and I think government needs that. As somebody who's worked, I'm a city employee, <laughs> but I think it's good that there are artists in the mix in, in the city of Philadelphia. And I think that you, they, they should be pushed and there's mutual, it's mutually beneficial. Yeah. So Carlton and Ennis, how would you, what, I'm interested how you respond to the idea about government, gov the role of government, government funding. Yeah, I, I think, for one, uh, queering the understanding. I love that. Uh, I love that phrase. And and I, I would queer the understanding of what government funding is. It's, it's the people's money. Yeah. Um. And and the government, and when it's working best, it's working, um, to to move forward the the best interests of the people. Uh. And so when we're thinking about inside outside, these are. These are binary ideas that actually should not even uh, be the reference point by which we talk about our relationship to um, to policymakers and to um, and to the, the the governance structure. It should be, you know, we're all working in, in concentric circles to to build the type of communities and the type of cultural output for our nation uh, that that lifts everyone into prosperity, that lifts everyone into health that lifts everyone into spaces of, of thriving and prosperity. Uh, and, and so those are the things that I think about. Like for me, uh, the, you know, to have a bunch of millionaires sitting around making laws and policies for a bunch of people that are living their lives in poverty um, is, is not an equitable framework. Uh, and so we have to readjust the way that that, that body functions um, at, a, at a foundational level in order for the, the, the needs and the will of the people to be manifested in policies that actually work for their benefit. Um, and so that's, that's the way I think about it. And I know that's, we're a long way from there right now, but, but I see that that is the only place that we could really move towards if we're talking about equity and justice as the framework for our, for our work together. And is there anything you wanna add? Yeah, I think that I think it's important to remember that, again, we live in a democracy and the government, that's a big word, but there's all sorts of examples. And I think even Raquel, the, what you're talking about at a grassroots level is often um, there are examples of that in local government, like the more local you get the more interconnected government is with the lives of people. I mean, look at a school board. I mean, we don't, <laughs> we don't have a lot of experience of that, of that here in Philadelphia with our school history, but at a, very, at a very, very local level, if you think about government being something like a school board, you wouldn't have, you know, you always have power problems and you always have um, tension in terms of politics. But the more the more you open it up for people to be engaging in it in different ways, the more it's it's there and it's supposed to be representing um, the people. So it seems to me that, um, yeah, I, I I have a different kind of perspective on the other side of the coin, which is like we can't leave it all to private because we're we need we need to have a cultural common good understand we need to have an understanding of what is common good and um equitable and for everybody and that is something that you know in a lot of it i wouldn't even say it was lip service at the time but the wpa did not exist in perpetuity so it came in you know it kind of like boosted up jobs and it seriously did give people money in their pockets of all backgrounds all backgrounds and women and I mean so many people were working in the WPA but it wasn't it it, it was an emergency band-aid to deal with what was going on with the depression um, and if you can kind of like step out of that and think well why do we presume to Carlton's point why do we presume that just because we live in a capitalist country that everything's going to be also 
solved by the private only um, figuring everything out. This is our bag to figure out. Yeah, that's right. So, um, you know, Raquel, going back to your, your statement about philanthropy, I agree. Um, and so what does it look like on the ground? Are these, uh, do, you, do you see it as fellowships? Uh, how, how does it not become, I don't mean this in this pejorative way, I wouldn't say it, but another grants program, you know? Uh, so, um, you know, or, or it's like individuals, organizations, both, like what, could you talk a little bit about that, how it plays out? Thanks. Um, I think that um, going back to um, some of what I was saying earlier, just in terms of um, the looking at what the current systems that exist, the private sector and, and philanthropy, right, and, and the incredible um, amount of gatekeeping that exists within that. I think getting rid of that so it doesn't feel like so much of a Hunger Games experience would be huge, right? So that you don't have a system of, of where you have individual winners and losers, um, but really just finding the things, um, really thinking about it in, in a much larger, um, larger way, more expansive way, um, where you have entire sectors of community that are, are offered not just funding, but also infrastructure, right? A place to do their work, a place to build community, a place to continue to meet and, and work together. Um, I think infrastructure is huge. Um, and then in terms of like what it, like what it also, what it looks like on the ground, I think we also need to just go back to a really core understanding of, of considering who the experts are, right? The people who are on the front lines, people who are on the ground, um, people who are used to working with impacted communities cultural workers, healthcare workers, um, people who really understand the real needs and who have seen solutions in practice, people who are developing those solutions already. Um, I think elevating people from the front lines is really huge from working class communities into places of decision making, thinking about our elders, thinking about cultural bears, thinking about really bringing these people to, like offering seats at the table for people to make the decisions that will affect their communities are, is, is huge. Um, so yeah, I think really thinking about who, what an expert is, right? Trusting experts, thinking about elders, cultural bearers, and thinking about infrastructure. Like there are ways to support community beyond just money. And um, I think both of those things are really important for thinking about how it would roll out on the ground. And and Ennis, when you think about how things did roll out on the ground, in the WPA, and thank you for what you said before. I thought that was it was really eloquent. Um, can you like what what were the flaws and what would what should do you feel like, well, these are certain things we should be on the, you know, like sort of to be on the lookout for? Like, I would, I'd, you know, like someone who studied this for so many years, advice you have, like red flags. Yeah. That exist. So, caveat my real, my emphasis is on the poster division. So, I understand that the most. Mm -hmm. The most common perception of the WPA was that it was, um, you know, kind of like busy work for people um, and that uh, not much got done, which is more about a public image of that story, um, like uplifting the, the people that are doing the work, not the like, oh, we, we solved everything with a, a program, <laughs> which kind of gets at what everybody's saying here and what you were saying of, not, of another grants program. So I think there is a danger in making it an ideological, like magic potion um, that's that is undervalues what it takes to really run a society. Like it's, it, it takes a lot of work. <laughs> so it's not just a uh, one, you know, one and done. And, and I think that that is something that we can learn from that. I do think that there was in in specific to the poster division and the posters that are being shown at um, Carpenters Hall as part of this exhibit that we helped curate the, there was a distinction between fine artists and commercial artists, and the commercial artists were not actually um, allowed to attribute their work. They weren't allowed to sign their work. They weren't allowed to keep copies of their work, even though it was mass-produced stuff. Um, and so I think that there's a, always a danger of hierarchies that miss the point of a common good, of a public program. Um, and so what Raquel was talking about, about making sure that all sorts of people are in roles of leadership. Um, that's that 
definitely was the same kind of issue in the original WPA. Um, yeah, I think it's I think it's the same same stuff. Yeah, no, I see that. So, so I, so I'm I'm sort of a, a practical person, right? So, um, so how do you? I think this is for all of you, actually. How do we make a? How do we make this a public um, priority? Who are you hoping will pick this up and help drive this? Um, who I. I We've all acknowledged that there would be a role for government and government funding. Um, is it done locally? Is it done nationally? Is it working through the White House? Uh, do you work through Congress? Um, does it come through existing channels like the NEA or Commerce or HUD? Is it local CDCs? And um, what's the role for the community? I'm just going to preface this by saying that we are at the very beginning, at the beginning stages of speaking with policy experts about how to roll these ideas out. And so I'm really excited to have these conversations with people who've been doing this work for a very long time, people like Arlene Goldbard and Roberto Bedoya, um, people who have a more solid understanding than I do, um, just because they've been in the trenches for much longer. Um, but um, one of the things that we're really considering is that, you know, that as Carlton was naming earlier, the, the, we're currently looking at a really dangerous situation where the, our, our new democratic administration and people who, all of us who sort of helped to bring them in are just relieved to sort of go back to normal, but back to normal doesn't work for us, right? And back to normal actually looks like an incredibly teeny amount of funding for arts and, a so, and, and for a social system that just doesn't work, that's not enough. Um, so, we're actually considering, yes, what does it look like to roll out on a national level, but um, more specifically with the toolkits that we'll be offering um, within the publication and outside of that and online and through different workshops, we're looking at what it looks like on a hyper-local level, right? Um, something like a really easy thing to lift up is participatory budgeting, right? How can you make sure that people are, that, that all cities are engaged in things like participatory budgeting so that the people can, whether you're documented or not, whether you're 15, or 65, you, you, you can have a say in how funds are distributed in your neighborhood, right? Um, but yeah, just thinking about different toolkits that we can offer um, community members on a hyper-local level to see how they can affect policy. Because as, uh, as you were saying, Ennis, it's much easier to do that on the hyper-local level, right? Yeah, uh, Carlton? Yeah, um, what's coming to mind for me is, is, is you know, some of the, the basics, you know, what are the fundamentals that people need? And, and, and especially as, as this pandemic has highlighted so many of the structural inequities um, that, that our country and our nation is dealing with, where black and brown people have taken the brunt of this pandemic, uh, both with deaths and, and illnesses, but also looking at what are the long-term impacts of, of, of COVID on black and brown communities, on poor communities. Um, and so one of the things I would speak for would be like having access to quality health care. Like that's, that's something that would, you know, would be a benefit that would be beneficial for the entire community, not just the individuals that are part of a system. I think, I think having a living wage, like these are, they're not arts things, you know, they're, they're people things. And I think that that's where we have to, to remember our role is about, is our work is about creating the, the, the environment where uh, these things that our community needs become tangible. Uh, and, and for me, you know, it, artists, so many artists go through, through life not having access to quality health care, not having access to uh, consistent um, housing, not having access to um, a pension. So you work till you drop, you know, it's like, these are, the, these are the, the ways that artists have been taught that their lives will, will unfold. And it's very similar to, movements, uh, to movement leaders. You know, they work hard, they give everything they have so that the community can benefit, um, but there's no benefits baked into their existence. And so you, 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 run, out of, you run out of runway, you, you run into a wall, you, you, and, and, and you die penniless and you die, you know, of things that probably could have been you know, um, prevent it. 
And so I think these are the ways that, that I'm thinking about how can the work that we're doing here at the Mississippi Center for Cultural Production change the quality of life for our community, not just for the artists that are part of the organization or that the artists that come in, in contact with us or that we partner with, but how does the work that we do have an actual impact on changing the material conditions of the community that we're part of? And how can that then expand to other communities? So those are the practical ways that I'm thinking about the work. How can we produce fresh food uh, to provide better food for a community that doesn't have access, that is, that is, that is dealing with food insecurity, but also has a history of food and cultural production? That's, that's a real issue that I think we can dig in on uh, and we can access stories, we can access songs, we can access food and recipes, and we can access um, you know, all types of, of beautiful things that, that can uplift our community culture in ways that actually improve those material conditions. Right. Yeah, I think, I think it's a multi-pronged approach and the, the, all of everything, <laughs> it all has to be in, like all in, um, to rebuild, uh, to newly build what we haven't imagined yet. And we, it's going to take a lot of imagining and work, but I do think it's, uh, you know, as an example, during the original WPA, the original funds were issued through something called the National Recovery Act. And that was a pool of money that was an executive order that just got like passed through. And that pool of money started going out locally and down to the state level, it was administered on a state level. Mm -hmm. But another aspect of it is that there was a public call to action for employers specifically targeted to employers. And the private entrepreneurial enterprise people that, and maybe it's arguable, but that back then there was more of a, I don't know, uh, people who respond to like the idea of government authority, but I think there's still that. Um, I think that's one of the things that kind of holds back innovation is this idea that the government's supposed to figure it out or somebody else is supposed to figure it out. But that they are, there was a a specific propaganda operation asking employers to hire two people for, you know, to stretch their budgets and try to hire two people instead of like not hiring because they were afraid that they would run out of money. And I think that social enterprise, I mean, I'm, I, my organization is a, is a social enterprise. It's a, it's a, pri it's a small business. And I do think that there is, there, we can't just have government, big government pools of money or big philanthropic pools of money. We have to have people who actually like are part of the local economies um, really investing in all sorts of different skill levels, including the imaginers and the artists and the people who will bring about the next wave. Right. Yeah. And I yeah. Oh, go ahead, Raquel. There's just one thing that I want to add. I, I, I feel that there's, you know, I was listening to Carlton speak about some of the work that is being developed in, in Mississippi around food. And I think that there's um, a true need for, for training as well that's built into this, right? Specifically around thinking about um, alternatives to the nonprofit industrial complex, right? Um, what, what are different cooperative models that we can train people to engage in? What are different land ownership models we can, we can support, right? Currently, our system is pretty much you either rent or you own. And hopefully, you get a really good deal on either of those if you live in a big city, you know, or even if you live in a rural area. Um, but what, what does a community land trust look like, right? How, is the, how do you engage in something collectively like that to protect land for 100 years and make it accessible for a large group of people? So I think that there's, again, coming back to this idea of imagining, right? I think there's a, a, a huge role to play um, for people to, to, to develop workshops and trainings to, to help create a new system um, that's different to the one that we currently have and it's just flawed in many ways. Right. So, and, and I also like the idea that it's porous. Like as you were talking, Carlton, I was thinking we have a, we have a partnership with the Department of Behavioral Health and we have a, a, a I won't go in, into a long story about it, but um, they do great work. And we have a storefront in Kensington. It's a part of the city where the opioid crisis is at its height. And in the storefront, there's, you know, our, our programs, but there's 
There's also visiting nurses and there's information about where to get a bed and there's spoken word and theater workshops and people doing mural making, but all day long, it's like social services and the arts and people call it the Kensington storefront. It's not even a sort of overtly affiliated with mural arts, which I think is good because it's co-ownership. It's more that it belongs really to the community. And because I think that when we separate out, there's the arts and then there are these other other things, then the arts get further marginalized. So I, I sort of want to just, I just am very attracted by how you're talking about this integration of the of these different worlds. Um, so uh, so thank you actually. Um, so so and now so just bit, just going back to what you're saying. So for thirty years we've we've like. I think over the years, we've probably hired about 15, 20,000 artists. I mean, that's not like an exaggeration. We, we hire about 250 artists every year. So everybody gets paid, middle school kids on up. Um, so, uh, and a lot of art, for a lot of artists, it's been like, they've gone on, some are still connected with us, some are not, but they've gone on to do, you know, many things. So I think um, when you think about opportunities for artists and cultural workers, especially black, brown, indigenous, and other workers of color, so I, I like what you're saying about how, you know, like thinking about like it's not just a job as a as as doing art, but sort of like a like the civic space, like working in the civic space. So when you you know, there's like people creating, maintaining gardens, creating co-ops. I think about you know providing essential services, working on developing enterprises that build community and community wealth. Because I often think about power and how it has to shift and the, the shifting the paradigm around resources. So when you think about the WPA that you're, that you're sort of creating now, when you think about priorities and what you would roll out first, what does that look like to you? Like what comes, what would be, the, you talked about toolkits and sort of building sort of collaborators and partners. Um, and so what, how do you sequence it? Yeah, I think it's really going back to what the essential um, forms of labor are, right? Health, right? How do we make sure that people have access to healthy food, that people have access to seeds, that people have access to growing food in places where there might be little light because they live in urban centers? Um, so we're looking at health, at, at, at health through food, right? We're also looking at, at health through... Um, through medicine, right? How, how can we make sure that black women have access to a place to have a child and not have to deal with the incredibly high infant mortality rate that currently exists, right? How do we make sure they're supported with doulas and with midwives? Um, so thinking about how health looks within society, thinking about how education looks, how do we make sure that um, kids in schools are equipped with art making, are equipped with enough time to go outside and run around. Um, how do we make sure that people are getting back to the earth and digging their hands in soil, right? I think so much of it just really comes back to connecting us um, with the earth and with our history, with ancestral traditions, um, really building intergenerationally. Um, I think, you know, a lot of the, the, the work that our collabor collaborators are engaged in is just that. Um, preparing society. So, um, I mean, you know, the seven themes that we've lifted up as, as themes of labor, name what some of you just asked, uh, what some of what Jane, you just asked is, you know, um, and uh, looking at the carceral state and how it's creating just devastating complete cities, right? Um, eradicating that and, and providing jobs programs for people to re-enter society and places to actually heal from the trauma that prisons have caused to them and their families. So there's, I mean, there's a huge array of ideas for where we could start and um, that's what we're hoping that the peoples of UPA can support. Wonderful, thank you. Carlton. Yeah, um, I, I think, you know, one, this is just an important uh, conversation for us to be having, not just in a panel, but in our communities uh, at the local level. Um, so much of the way that artists are thought about um, is, is about our ability to help others escape. And, and, and that's a very narrow idea of what, what artists can do. Um, when I think about art, 
for me, it, it goes back to community always. Like art is always an extension and a representation of a community. The question is, what community are you representing? And so much of the, the art that gets lifted up uh, on the, the, the highest stages where artists are actually being paid um, for their work at, at ways in which they can live um, is in service of communities that are living their lives on the backs of others. And that's an important just context for, for me to hold uh, as I think about supporting artists and supporting the arts in my own community. Um, what does it look like on the ground? Who are the practitioners and the culture bearers and the culture holders in my community? How can I support them in doing what they already do? Not asking them to do something new or do something in addition to, but because they've already been holding the burden of, of supporting a culture on their shoulders for, for nothing. They haven't been getting, getting resources to do that. How can I resource them to take a little of the strain and stress pressure off of them? To me, that's what the WK means to me, is to resource those that are already actively engaging in cultural support, cultural production, uh, that are actually the backbones and the center of their communities. Yeah. I just want to say one thing, which I think is a cute anecdote. When I joined the, 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 the USDAC, um, the, people, the People's WPA was an idea, right? Um, and Carol had been, uh, Carol Zhao had been really spearheading the listening calls. And what I heard Carol say was, I want to find a way to fund the Tamale lady who feeds people on the corner and creates a space for kids and elders to come together and hang out and share stories. And I think for me, that's what a people's WPA is, right? How do we make sure that people who are supporting that cultural fabric, feeding people, creating place, places for people to come together, how do we make sure that they're supported, that they can put food on their tables, that they can send their kids to school, that they don't have to worry about their kids, you know, being at home without anybody else there to watch them. Um, it's just, it's about making sure that people are provided with the basic necessities. That's right. Yeah, I, there's sort of a, a judgment that abounds about what is sort of fundable, what is le le legitimate, right, in the, in the arts world, or, or what, they, there's a definition that is so narrow. Even when we started painting murals back in the day, uh, the program that we, we used to work for was called the Anti-Graffiti Network. It was way more interesting than the name of the program sounds, but uh, people would say, you're not doing public art, and we would say, we're in public doing art. It was like me and like a like hundreds of graffiti writers and we'd be like well what are we doing and the people would say as if they had a lemon in their mouth they did social work like it was like hey. and we'd be like i'd be like i said would say to everyone hold your heads up this is like, this work is important we're going to be vindicated and then suddenly the term social practice comes along and people are like oh my god it's so brilliant i'm like oh shush <laughs> i don't know what i even hear it from you <laughs> so yeah no that's i love that i love what carol said so finally my last question because then we want to then i know people have questions so um what is for all of you what is your largest and most ambitious vision for success if your work on the people's wpa or cultural new deal were recognized and supported fully how would things look for cultural workers and artists a few years from now? I know you've sort of said it, but as a summary, like it's two years from now, you're looking back. What do you see? I would say, <laughs> you know, from a, an ambitious perspective that um, the that there is actually some sort of, of, of cultural um, arm uh, of the federal government um, not just in name or uh, holding a position or a cabinet position, um, but but that is it's this part is really important that the 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 perspective is framed from an indigenous point of view. Um, that that the worldview in which the 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 new arts and culture sector is operating from is from an indigenous perspective, uh, and the reason that I feel that that is important is because it reintegrates art back into daily life in a way that is different from the way that our current art structure is set up. The current art structure is set up to, to put art over there on the stage or in that place on the screen or, you know, on the, you know, wherever that is different from where the people are. And the indigenous perspective helps us to reintegrate arts and culture 
back into the fabric of everyday life so that everyone can can see themselves as a participant of, uh, as a participant of, of creating culture as a, a producer of culture as a producer of art as a um, as a consumer of, 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 of their culture um, and that's very ambitious viewpoint but that's where I'm gonna go with it yeah, thank you yeah I, I um without speaking about anything practically per se, I think it just, you know, currently we've all been sharing this, this, this very, we're, we're all sharing a place of fear, right? We've been stuck in this pandemic for so long. We're seeing so many cases skyrocket, skyrocket every day. I think in, in, in two years, just, just knowing that people can breathe. Um, I feel like folks, especially people of color, have just been in a, in a place of not being able to breathe, not knowing where their next paycheck's gonna come from, um, how they're gonna make it work. And, and for me, again, coming back to your idea, Jane, of like, you know, pre-social practice, what does that look like? Um, I think it's, it's just making sure that our, our country is able to provide people the support that they need so they can breathe. Um, and that in itself is tremendous. Yeah, I agree. Ennis? Yeah, there's not much more I could add to any of that. I agree. <laughs> yes. I think, okay. I, I think that's time. I think like, you know, freedom, freedom to like be and do and trust, trust that, that we're all in it together. Thank you. Thank you all very much. So now we're going to go to questions. Everybody submit your questions to the Q&A box and I'm going to read them okay okay so here we have a question it's um, what can we do to encourage President Biden to create a new federal art project to employ people without jobs who have artistic talent to get them off unemployment and create art for the people who would like to answer that I would just like to say that the original WPA was a, an executive order. So the question was about what we can do to encourage yeah. that. And Biden. Um, but it, I think it's important to remember that there are some things that can, you know, when we ask the question of like, how do we do it? In some ways it's like, we just need to do, we just do it. We just start doing it. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. Yeah, I, I, I would echo that. I'm, I'm currently, as I mentioned earlier, in Laredo, Texas, with um, family in the place where I grew up. Um, and uh, we're currently trying to resist the building of a giant wall um, in our neighborhood. Um, and for us, the demand is cancel the wall on day one, executive order, right? Um, and, and again, I uh, echo, to echo you, Ennis, I think it's, it's, asking for the executive order if possible, right? But um, as, as artists, as cultural workers, as organizers, that happens in many ways, right? It's demanding it from the outside. It looks like letter writing campaigns. It looks like creative direct actions. It looks like mobilizing in the streets. It looks like sometimes producing a publication and making sure that you have enough that you can, you know, send them all to um, people on the um, transition team. Um, there are many ways to pressure from the outside to make sure that change happens from the inside. And, and also, you know, I mean, that's, that's big government, that's, that's Biden, you know, I think that there are other ways we can start on the hyper local level that, yeah. that, are, that might be more accessible. Yeah. yeah. Carlton? Uh, I would just say, you know, this, this year we saw, and, and I'm not a public art specialist, so I'm just gonna speak some stuff and you tell me if it's wrong or right, Ennis um, and Jane. Um, one of the largest public art, um, displays in, in our nation's history with the murals that uh, came out after the, the, the riots and the, the street protests. Um, there's some energy there and that I think can be explored um, in terms of how do, we, how do we utilize public art to, to address larger, large scale community and, and, and um, societal issues. So that's one thing that I think can be brought that is not at all out of the framework of like, oh, that's just crazy. No, actually, we've been doing it most of this year. Uh, the other part, I think, uh, Mellon, the Mellon Foundation has been engaging in this conversation around monuments, um, which is another place where our country needs like 
real work done to, to, to think about the things that we build monuments to, to think about what that says about our history, about our values. Um, and there's a real place there for, for that conversation to intervene across education, across college campuses, across civic spaces, cities, you know, small towns, you know, you name it, humanities. So I think we, we already have like two really low hanging fruits there that can be picked uh, around public art and, and national dialogues that I think uh, the Biden administration would, would be apt to, to, to take up immediately. Um, but I, you know, I don't know. I don't just put that there. <laughs> okay. Um, how does the USDA relate to the National Endowment of Arts and Humanities? In Connecticut, they have turned the Arts Commission into a Department of Tourism. Is that a question for me, the USDAC? So the, oh, the US. I'm sorry. It said USDA. But yes, you, I'm sure yes. that's what they meant. Uh, so the U USDAC is not actually a government funded institution. We're not an, an actual government institution. We're a network of uh, cultural workers, artists, activists who are working to build the world that we want to see. So we exist as a provocation because there should be a US Department of Arts and Culture. And maybe that's what we ask Biden to do. <laughs> Just point of clarity there. Um, should I go to the next one or anyone else want to jump in? I'll just I'll just say that I think a lot of the state art agencies and local art agencies um, that are pressed for money are turning to the arts as a way of tourism. Uh, and I and I'm, I've seen it here in Mississippi and across the South um, that that is the go to um, make, you know, create something in your community that that people will want to come see. Uh, and I think this pandemic has shown us that that's not something that you can actually bank on because that comes and goes. But I, I think it's a very uh, challenging practice to turn uh, arts, arts organizations or the arts, the, the, the city art spaces into cultural tourism. Mm -hmm. I would like to say that the thing that, you know, brought us together was the exhibit that is at Carpenter's Hall right now. And I think the distinction in these posters is called Places for the People because it was posters that were celebrating these places um, in Philadelphia. And I do think that part of, at the time, part of the reason why tourism was being promoted in the 30s was the Depression and also the impending World War II. So people were not traveling out of the country. And so there was an effort to get people to, to travel around in the United States to see what else, you know, kind of to see, you know, the propaganda piece of it was to see the rich history and culture of the United States. I think that this, I think the one slight difference is the, um, the commercial artist, what I think they were do, what I think that WPA poster division was often doing was repurposing our other public narrative in this country, which is commercialism and um, to honor spaces just for themselves with no message to actually like come visit or anything, just like Carpenter's Hall. You get to decide if it's beautiful, if it's of value. It's really like just in memor like memorializing place, I think is another part of the way to think about that. Um, I don't think that's common. I think what's mostly done is the commodification of a place. Um, but I, I do think that these posters in particular that um, are at Carpenter's Hall are a little bit of both and um, more giving, trusting the public to decide the, that these are just like worth it to like think about and to value. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question is how would you support young pe people in high school or just moving into the workforce or trying to determine their future with more justice and equity? Yeah, these are some really loaded questions. Um, I, I think, um, you know, I'm going to bring this up again. Um, our, our young people are dealing with a climate catastrophe uh, that will, will change the fundamental way that their lives are lived. 
and they're not being educated to engage in that future. And so I think that, that the work that is important um, for me is to make sure that young people understand the stakes that, uh, that they're moving into. Um, case in point, my son is, is one of hundreds of thousands of graduates that just graduated from college in May. Uh, another batch graduated in August and we're about to have another batch graduating in December into the worst economy since the depression. So the whole plan of life, life that they had put forth, they were like, they were moving in this trajectory is now uh, uh, being altered and they are given an education to be put on a path but not the critical thinking skills and the analytical skills to help figure out the moment. And so there's, that's something that we have to invest in in our young people, specifically our high school students, our middle school students, uh, to begin to, to build their critical thinking capacity stronger because that's, those are the skills that are gonna be the most valuable skills in the 21st century, is your ability to critically think, is your ability to um, to think outside of the paradigms that we've been kind of like steeped in. Um, I'm part of the first generation that have done worse financially and uh, at, than our parents. Uh, and, you know, that will continue to be the, the situation because capitalism doesn't work, you know. And so those are real issues. And I think when we don't address them, when we tend to deal with them with kids' gloves uh, and make these subjects taboo, then we have a country ignoring some of the most critical issues of our time because they're not the most popular issues to talk about. Yeah, Carlton, you know, the first thing I was, I was thinking is uh, you prepare them by offering them alternatives to the current high school system <laughs> um, because current curriculums just don't, don't, number one, they don't teach true history. And number two, they don't te teach critical skills that actually allow students to thrive or, to, or to, 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 to build in the world that is, is currently available for them. Um, so alternative forms of lear learning, connecting them to uh, cultural organizations, uh, different working groups, places that might connect them to understanding what urban farming looks like. Um, real skills that people need uh, to survive in this world, connecting them to organizations like 350.org where they can get organized and think about ways of impacting policy and think about what climate justice looks like. Um, uh, again, this idea of cultural bearers and, and elders, right? Connecting them to, to people that have uh, wisdoms, uh, historic wisdom to share. Um, so I think preparing youth looks like offering alternatives to high school curriculums. Okay, here. okay, next question. We're talking about creative and cultural commons, which require not just funding, but physical space, like the storefront that Jane referenced, space to create, to perform, convene, exhibit, share, and listen. Here in Philly and in many cities, we're seeing community gathering spaces in the form of historic churches be demolished or carved up or privatized in the form of fancy condos, where the community amenities include gated building access. How can we get cities to create initiatives to help shrinking congregations to convert their historic buildings into community centers since they're already designed as such and prevent their selling them, selling them out to developers? That's my WPA dream for all those spaces to be super activated as community centers um, like the Calv Calvary Center versus the Sanctuary Lots. That's great. Uh, Partners for Sacred Places is an organization here in Philly that does some of that, um, where they partner uh, uh, houses of worship with nonprofit organizations and community-based organizations. I'm just sighing. It was a great question. I think there was also a, an initiative here in Philly when the when the homeless population was being like evacuated from their territory that, um, you know, negotiated the use of empty buildings and places for people to go. Um, Project Home did a lot of that, you know, that, but it has to be really, it's not done on a, um, like, governmental level. It's always the people that, some kind of spark of uh, enterprise that makes that happen. 
Yeah, I think it's a really great, great, great question. I mean, I got chills just listening to it, right? Because that's um, really central to this idea that I was talking about earlier around infrastructure. Um, and it makes me also connect to the idea you have community land trust, right? Who owns that building? Can they actually build a community land trust so that for a hundred years, the board members of that can decide how that space is used? Um, I, I mean, I think that it's actually maybe without trying to see how you can turn all of these 20 spaces in this city in, into um, a cultural hub in perpetuity. Um, start with one um and maybe uh figure out what community district it's in who the council member is and you know work with them mm -hmm. um i do think there are ways of of, of developing it and I, I i think we need they it exists models exist um yeah. so right. i think figure out how to do it for one <laughs> okay here we go another next question uh, for raquel how, how do you see participatory budgeting making its way into government and institutional processes and that is someone from Mural Arts who asked that question. <laughs> oh, here. There are entire countries that have precedence for it. Brazil uses participatory budgeting on a national level. Um, I've been involved with the participatory budgeting project in New York City and um, have just been really moved by um, how much impact it can have. Also, just uh, have so many critiques about, about government and the things that we are funding with participatory budgeting like ACs and schools and like new water pipes or bus stops like things that actually should just be built into public uh, into public infrastructure so I have some critiques there but um, I, uh, I think that there are models that exist um, both nationally outside of the United States and then within within this country um, there, are, there are many cities that have participatory budgeting programs um, and the, the participatory budgeting project um, is a website that you can visit to to see some of those precedents and to learn. Oh, great, more. we're doing a major quilt project about participatory budgeting. I'm sure the city will find me very annoying soon, but that's okay. Great, great, great. <laughs> oh, another mural person, artist, great artist. Has the has the People's WPA formally requested a conversation and presented ideas with the Biden Harris team? We have not, but we should. Um, I, I am sure the Biden Harris team is getting so many requests right now. Not to say that we shouldn't, but we definitely should. And um, where you know, once we build out our publication, that's where we'll really take it to the next level. And again, um, you know, we're thinking about inside-outside strategy. So how can we both um, address the transition team? Um, and then, you know, uh, once January 20th comes along, address the new administration, but then also build public will by demanding public will through beautiful public interventions that tell our story and build, um, uh, create national media and other attention. Great. All right. Well, that wraps it up. So Raquel and Carlton, know we've had a good inside outside game here in Philly. However, we can be value added. Please let us know. We're like ready to sprint in, into action. Um, however. And I want to just say that it's been, I feel honored and humbled to be with all of you this evening. Um, so really, thank you from the bottom of my heart for all you do. Ennis, it's great to see thank you again. You Ennis, you on a mural <laughs> with us some years back, and it's beautiful. Okay. But really, thank you. And Michael Norris, I want to thank you so much in Carpenters Hall. This has been awesome. Yeah, thanks for hosting. Thank you, Michael and Jane. Thank you all.